Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful. Welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting. What is the Islamic greeting? Aaron, you know that. Where are you? Yeah, what is the Islamic greeting? Assalamu Yeah, Assalamu Alaikum. That means what? Not hi, right? <laughs> that means peace of God be upon you. And the reply to that greeting would be what? Wa alaikum as Wa alaikum as right? May God's peace be upon you too. So I heard that question. Someone asked the question that why is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him? Why is he the last and the final prophet? Uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, reason number one, and Emily, you may know this, right? So in the Quran, it says in chapter 33, verse number 40 to be exact, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the seal and the final prophet. Because we take Quran to be as the word of God. If God is saying that he's the last prophet, we accept it, we believe it. The second reason also, see the role of the prophets is that they want to convey the message, do the interpretation, and they want to apply the guidance of the Quran uh, on the society. So what we say and what we believe is that uh, anything the society needs for its success uh, from the spiritual point of view, from technological point of view, from beneficial point of view, any which way, the Quran has enough information in there, enough guidelines, enough do's and don'ts in there. So for that reason, there is no need for a new prophet, a new book or a new messenger. So Brother Akram mentioned that uh, he named somebody as the first prophet. Who did he say? Adam, right? So the very first man, Adam, is the very first prophet in Islam. So the concept of prophethood is this. You know, we say, and the Quran says, that God wants to help and guide humanity. So to guide humanity, God does not come down and becomes a human, according to Islam. He does not come down and become uh, an idol or, a, or any part of the creation. He remains God and he appoints, he chooses from uh, the humans, messengers and prophets, and he sends revelation to them. So the very first one is Adam, the last one is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, so based upon your knowledge, can you name maybe, let's say, five more prophets of Islam, all right? In the Quran, 25 of them are mentioned. So what you can do is you can mention these five who may also be common to the Quran and also to the Bible. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, Adam is done. Five more besides Adam, all right? Oh, okay. uh, Moses, Jesus, uh, Abraham. Okay, three more to go, right? There you go. Abraham, right? Uh, two more to go. Uh, does, uh, does Muhammad count? <laughs> no, well, no, he will not count. <laughs> well, he will count as a prophet, but since we already mentioned, okay, five more, so you have to mention two more or one more, right? Two more, yes. Yeah, Prophet Yusuf which is um, my son's name, Yusuf, right? <laughs> oh, Yusuf is here. You? All right. So Yusuf is Joseph in the Old Testament, correct? Uh, okay, fine. Let's go with one more. And I'll give you a hint, all right? Who was uh, the eldest son of Abraham, Prophet Abraham? He's the younger son. No, Jacob is not the son of... Uh, No, not Yusuf. <laughs> Ishmael, right? Ishmael, you got it up there, right? Ishmael. All right, here is one more quiz question, guys. Yep. Just to make sure that all of us are awake, all right? Who do you think is mentioned the most by name in the whole Quran? Which prophet? And a hint is that that prophet is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. You guys are now repeating each other, right? <laughs> one person says Abraham, and one says Abraham. You said, uh, Abraham, Muhammad, or Jesus? Uh, you cannot say this, this, or that, okay? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Just imagine having that answer on the test, all right? <laughs> now you know what we go through. I know. I'm also a teacher. I used to teach a Sunday school for nine years, all right? <laughs> so I know. Okay, fine. You still get 25% right, all right? <laughs> 
Muhammad peace be upon him is not directly mentioned. Uh, I mean, so he's there in the in the Bible uh, in a prophetic way. Uh, okay, who do you say? Okay, his name starts with M. Moses. Moses, you guys know it, right? So Moses is mentioned 136 times in the whole Quran, right? The prophet mentioned almost in every page, almost in every chapter, his message of oneness of God, his uh, miracles, his challenges, his fight with the Pharaoh, and how Pharaoh got drowned. So all of those things are mentioned all the way, you know, spread out in the whole Quran. All right, so that's prophethood, right? Okay, as I was talking to Aaron as he was coming down the stairs, I asked him the question, okay, what class is this? And you said this is a world religion class. And I asked him, okay, did you guys go over the chapter about Islam? And you said, yeah. yeah? Then I said, okay, it's a fair game for me to ask you guys questions. Yes. <laughs> All right? Yeah? Yes. I'm watching. There you go. Extra grade, right? <laughs> extra grade, perhaps. Extra credit to uh, <laughs> final, so. Wow, all right. So that helps you now. Okay, name me a pillar of Islam that Muslims do every day, many times. Prayer. 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 Wow, they got it. <laughs> Should they have a show of hand maybe for you to write down the name or remember? <laughs> yes? Now everyone, everyone is going to raise their hand now. Okay. <laughs> all right. Second, second question, all right. Name a pillar of Islam that if Muslim does it once in a lifetime, they're done with that. Okay, they all know that. Okay, so these are all the easy ones, all right? Okay, fine, one more pillar of Islam that Muslims do, or we just finished it. Ramadan, right? Ramadan. Any one of you fasted? Yusuf? Yeah? All 30 days? Yourself? What's your name? Amir? Mashallah. So how many Muslims in the class? Just show of hand. <laughs> All right, Aaron and Amir and Yusuf. Uh, okay. Yeah, Sister Emily, go ahead. Um, how old do you, like, how old, do you have to be a certain age to fast? Like, is it like a Sure. So that's a good question. When do kids start to fast? Is there a minimum age? Any obligation in Islam becomes obligatory when they reach the age of puberty. Yes. However, children, they start young. So my son, when he was seven years of age, now he's like in the fourth grade, when he was seven years of age, he fasted for the whole month. So Muslim fasting is not 24-7. Uh, I would not be here if I fasted 30 days, right? 24-7. It is from uh, dawn to sunset. So in the morning, we have the morning meal, a light meal, and we also have the date fruit. And then we start for the rest of like maybe 15 to 16 hours. In Norway, where my in-laws are, they fast for 21 hours a day. Imagine that, right? For the whole month. So then we break the fast at uh, sunset and then we can have the meal and the drink and water. So when we are fasting in the morning hours, not a single drop of water. Right? So children, they start fasting young because uh, you know, we want them to get prepared and they get ready and organically be ready as uh, you know, when the obligation comes in. Same thing with you know, my daughter, she was young, she started to wear the hijab. So now, I mean, no one has to tell her. She automatically, when she goes out of the home, she wears hijab. So it's not obligatory, but children, they do it. You know, children are so excited to wake up 4 a.m. in the morning, right? <laughs> they are. I used to be when I was young, and they wash their face and their hands, and they pray, and then they eat the meal, and they read the Quran, then they go back to sleep. And if there is school like today, my son is in school right now upstairs. His son is in school upstairs too. What they're doing, they, are, are, they have a special class to memorize the whole Quran. So go ahead, more questions? Yes, sir. If somebody were to convert to the religion of Islam, would they have to like, like be able to do something to be considered fully Muslim? Okay, very good. So how does a person convert to Islam? So this is the basement. We don't have a pool in the basement for baptism, all right? There is no dipping in the water. There are no rituals. 
for a person to convert to Islam, the person has to like fully understand the fundamentals of Islam, the six beliefs, the five pillars, and what is expected of that person. Then uh, he ha or she, he or he, she, they have to proclaim that I bear witness, there is no other God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. So in Arabic, it goes like this. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu That I bear witness, there is no other God besides one God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. So once a person proclaims it, understanding the fundamentals and making a commitment to live by it, that's how a person formally converts to Islam. Yeah. All right. More hands. Oh, yeah. yeah. What happens if you eat during Ramadan, like at the wrong time? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, in the, okay, so the question is what if you eat at the wrong time during the time of fasting? You know, in the initial first few days, like when I was in school, I was, uh, I was fasting, I was going, uh, passing through a fountain. And uh, by instinct, I went and I drank water. <laughs> All right? Some people, they actually eat because, you know, first few days people may forget by instinct. By mistake, if they eat or drink, it does not count, they can still continue the fasting. But if they do it purposely, right, obviously they break the fast and then there is a whole consequences, you know, they have to repent to God for intentionally breaking the fast. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you, like, health reasons, are you able to drink water? Okay, sure. Dehydrated or something? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So by default, every adult Muslim is supposed to fast. However, there are always exceptions, you know, exceptions. So one exception can be, if a person is sick, they don't have to fast. If the sickness is acute, they will get better. That means they can be exempted from those days and then they have to make up those days. Like last year, I missed a date of fasting because I had some back pain, something happened. So uh, I made up the fast, like after Ramadan or so. So acute illness, a person makes up the fast, but a person has a chronic illness, for example, you know, like old age or diabetes and uh, blood pressure, any other problem, if they cannot fast even after Ramadan, then they have to like feed one poor person for a day for the, for the days that they have missed. Yeah. Children, they are exempted to fasting. Yeah, I was going to come to that, right? Pregnant women, they are exempted uh, and later on they need to make up the fast. Girls and women going through the monthly cycle, they have to make up the fast later. And uh, who else? Any other exceptions? So these are the exceptions. So if you're able to make up, then you make up. If you're not able to make up because of these chronic uh, things, then you feed poor people. Yeah. Uh, I've been asking this to all the uh, religious houses we go to, and I was wondering, what is Islam's opinion on cloning? Okay, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Islam's opinion on cloning, right? Uh, cloning, uh, so for, for any new situations that may come up, what Muslims they do is they go back to the Quran and they go back to the prophetic example just to see if there is a precedence in those sources. But you know what? You may not find it because uh, organ transplantation or uh, cloning or blood uh, transfusion they were not present in the 7th century. So the scholars, what they do is, they take the basic principles from the Quran. So one of the principles of the Quran is this, that to save a life, uh, it's like saving the life of all of humanity. And to uh, take a life, is like taking the life of all of humanity. So if any scientific advancement, if it protects and if it uh, benefits humanity, uh, that means the scholars, they say, it is good to do it with the guidelines. AI, right? AI, it's scary. Elon Musk says that, you know, it may eliminate all of humanity. But then if you use it the right way, uh, with all the proper guidelines, it may help. Yeah. So for cloning, it's a kind of new. Um, even if the technology once comes up to clone humans, you know, I would say that uh, even, suppose if they clone you, they would not have the same personality. They will not, uh, yeah, you don't want that. 
<laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Peace be upon you. Peace be, yeah, he's saying peace be upon you, all right? <laughs> even the person who's cloned will not have the same experiences and the knowledge and the personality. You know, even if they clone Hitler, for example, right? I mean, he might be just working in the McDonald's, all right? <laughs> for example, he would not have the same background, context, experiences. Yeah. I have a question I ask everyone, and I make sure to ask the question after he asks. Okay, go for it. Um, humans have insane technological advances that were almost, in a sense, playing God, like were by, by a billion times over the most dominant species on this planet, or almost running other planet species and control genomes, and have insane mm -hmm. technology. Do you think we deserve that technology? Do you think we deserve this power we created for ourselves? Or do you think that ultimately we don't have it, as a species, we don't have the responsibility to use it? Because most uh, religious groups agree that God isn't special because he's powerful. It's special, he's special because he's powerful and he cares. Okay. So I do agree with the last statement that you mentioned that God is powerful, he cares for us, he's all-knowing. On top of it, any technology that we are using, any knowledge that we have, it is ultimately, we say, according to Islam, it's coming from God. Yes, humans may have developed it, we may have created new technologies, but ultimately God gave us that knowledge. So with that in context, any knowledge or any tool that God has given to us, we can use it or we can abuse it. If we use it the proper way, thanking the creator to benefit humanity, to be more productive, to unify humanity, uh, then we say that tool is good. But if we use the tool in the wrong way, oppressing people, for example, we can use the social media, right? To abuse each other and to abuse, uh, you know, people of other faiths and nationalities and cultures. Obviously, the consequences, we have to bear it as humans. So God knows that the knowledge he has given to us the chat GPT knowledge, right, or the AI knowledge, or uh, any knowledge or any tool he has given to us, uh, it's a test for humans. It's a test for humans. And we'll be held accountable on the day of judgment. How did we use that tool that God has given to us? So it's not that humanity is now becoming powerful and God-like. God already knows that. He gave it to us as a test. You know, every generation has a special test. And this is our test, the tool, the technology Allah, God has given to us, how we are going to use it for benefit of humanity and to please the Creator. What happens, yeah. what happens if um, you follow another faith? Like, is there punishment? Does the Quran say that there's punishment for people who don't follow the religion of Islam? Okay, sure. So what happens if a person uh, do not follow God's guidelines? So we say, and the Quran says, that uh, Islam is the faith that God has ordained for humanity. So Islam means that you're submitting to the Creator. You're not uh, worshipping a human, an idol, or animal, the plant, the trees, or creation. You're submitting to the Creator. For that reason, every prophet, they came to convey that message to their people. So chapter 16, verse 36 of the Quran mentions that point. So what happens if a person do not follow God's guidelines and do not uh, worship the Creator and uh, follow the instructions He has given? I would say that exactly the same thing would happen, suppose in a classroom, the teacher gives some instructions and if a student does not come to class or do not do the assignments or the quizzes and the exams, we say exactly the same thing will happen. So when it comes to Islam, there is no force. Means I cannot force you or anyone else to convert to Islam because Islam is a free choice. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse number 256 says that there is no compulsion, there is no force. No one should be forcing. We should be peacefully educating and conveying. If a person wants to convert, it's their choice. If they don't want to convert, it is their choice. But ultimately, this is what God says. If a person consciously rejects submitting to the Creator equals Islam, there would be consequences in the hereafter. 
you know, just like if you don't listen to the teacher, the teacher maybe keep on telling you, you know, your exam is coming, these are the notes, this is the book you have to read. But if a person is not reading it, not obeying the teacher and not following the instructions, there would be consequences. So according to Islam, there would be consequences. So one of the six uh, beliefs in Islam is that the concept of the hereafter. That one day we have to die and we have to face the creator. You know, just like at the end of the semester, uh, you evaluate all the students. We say this whole world, the whole life that we have, this is a preparation ground. This is a big classroom. And our ultimate teacher, according to Islam, is God himself. So God would be evaluating, according to Islam, every single person. How did they live their life? Who did they worship? What kind of deeds that they have done? If they submitted to the creator and follow God guidelines, according to Islam, the person by God's mercy, not by their own actions, by God's mercy would be placed into paradise. On the flip side of it, Islam does believe in the hellfire, right? Neither me nor him, anyone can say this person is going here, this person is going there. But God has given certain guidelines that if a person consciously rejects submitting to the creator, you know, equals Islam, despite knowing it, so there would be consequences if the person dies like that. So there would be hellfire according to the Quran. But I cannot say that this person goes there, that person goes there. Ultimately, God's immense justice will come into play on the day of judgment. All right. When it comes to apostasy, right? So one of your questions or the connotations is that if a person is a Muslim and now converts to some other faith, what happens to that person? There is no punishment in this life. If a person uh, joins some other faith and you know, try to have disharmony in the society, oppresses the Muslims, or does any other crime, uh, the consequences would be for that. But if the person peacefully just converts to some other faith, obviously the Muslim scholars would like to convince him or her. They want to educate if there are any, any misconceptions the person may have. But in the hereafter, there would be consequences, as I mentioned. Yeah, question. Christianity also submit to the similar God and have a lot of similar prophets, in fact some same prophets, would they be able to go to paradise if they're also submitting to basically the same God, just a different version? That's a deep question, right? So the, so the question is this, since uh, Judaism and Christianity, they also believe in the same God and similar prophets and similar commandments, right? What happens? Can they remain as a Jew and a Christian? Would they be going to paradise? Uh, the answer is there in the Quran, in chapter 3, verse number 85. So it says in there, if anyone follows a faith other than submitting to the Creator, uh, the person would be a loser in the hereafter. So what does it mean, submitting to the Creator or Islam? See, Islam is not just about worshipping the Creator, it is also knowing and following all the six beliefs, the five pillars and other obligations. So for a person to be a Muslim, um, you know, recipient of the mercy of the Creator, the person has to believe in the oneness of God and not associate any partners with God. It means we cannot say that, you know, God is God, but this human also have divine powers or this entity also have divine, you know, attributes. Um, that is committing the unpardonable sin in Islam. You know, just like in, just like in Christianity, what is the unpardonable sin in, in, in that faith? According to the New Testament, what is the unforgivable sin? The Holy Trinity. Uh, uh, the first sin. No, no, but like, oh, Islam, because they also... <clears throat> my first instinct is murder, but I don't think that's correct. Yeah, that's not correct, because uh, according to the New Testament, it is uh, blasphemy to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So just like in the New Testament, you have that ultimate sin that uh, Christians are not supposed to commit, According to Islam, the unforgivable sin is that to associate partners with God. Saying that, you know, God is God, I believe in it, but this human, this animal, this uh, idol also have attributes of God or taken also as God, along with God or instead of God. So if a person uh, does that, that is called as shirk. So what we say is that for a person to be a Muslim to receive uh, God's mercy and be inducted into paradise, 
they have to have the right concept of God, number one, right? No shirk means no associating partners. Number two, they have to believe in all the prophets, including Jesus and including Muhammad, peace be upon them. And our Jewish friends, they don't. The Christian friends, they don't uh, take uh, Jesus to be only as a prophet. They take him to be divine or son of God. And they reject Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, an analogy I can give is, you know, for you to graduate from high school, uh, you have to have, like, suppose 20, 20 credit hours. You just cannot say, you know what, what if I have, like, 16 hours, all the core classes, minus the four electives. The school is going to say, you know what, you still have to take those classes for you to be eligible to graduate. Exactly the same thing for Islam. You have to believe in the comprehensive belief system for a person to be safe according to the Quran. You know, there's so much chaos out in the world. God has given all of us important skills, you know, the knowledge. Uh, he has given us health and given us many, many resources. So try to be people to unify humanity, try to benefit humanity. No matter what the culture, the political, the economic situation of the world and the US, you and me, we should become people of goodness, ambassadors of peace, right? People who are there to unify humanity and a force of goodness for humanity. Uh, tools that God has given to us, may God help us to unify humanity, to be a force of goodness for humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so what we can do now is uh, let's head upstairs. Yeah. Sure. Oh, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so welcome. This is the mosque area. A mosque in Arabic is called as a masjid. M-A-S-J-I-D. So when Muslims, when we come here for five daily prayers, so obviously if I'm in the office, if somebody's in the school, they cannot come here. So they pray anywhere that they could. Front, uh, the first thing that you may be observing is that there is no statues, there is no idols. There is no depiction of God or of any prophet, not, in a, not even of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So when we pray, we pray directly to God without any mediator. Because one of the important attributes of God is that God is all-knowing. That means when we pray and we ask him for anything, there is no need for us to go through any mediator. Okay, question time. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can take the mic up there if you want. <laughs> okay, so the question is... How many people do you usually get? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. How many people do you uh, get usually that come here and pray? At the sure, night? sure. So we pray five times a day, okay? In the normal, the five times that we pray every day, we get about maybe approximately 300 people. All right? However, the Friday prayer, the Friday afternoon prayer, all the Muslim males, it's an obligation for them to come and pray. That means they have to leave the office, leave the school. They have to come to the mosque. Maybe in your school, there is a separate uh, place for prayer. The Muslims can pray there, I guess, right? Uh, but so on Friday afternoon, this whole thing will be full. Sometimes this is so full, people have to pray in the gym area. When that gets you know, filled up, they have to pray in the basement. When that gets filled up, we pray in all the classrooms. So let's imagine like 2,000 people, all right, on Friday. So there are so many people that we have to do two different sessions, two different services. So the Friday prayer is uh, preceded by a Friday sermon and then the prayer on Friday. Yeah, it's a good question, yes. Yeah. It's okay, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll just... Uh, okay. um, can you explain, um, you did such a good job explaining last time why <clears throat> men women pray separately in separate spaces. Very good, very good. So why do men and women, they pray separate? So this area that you see here, all the men, they pray here. Right, upstairs would be the women and the girls, they pray upstairs. So the question is, why do they pray separate? See, the actions that we do, the rituals and the prayers that we do, 
uh, we are following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So in his uh, mosque, men used to pray in the front, then the children and then in the back would be the women. So there would be separation between men and women. So we are following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For that reason, there is a separation. Now, some people may also say the logical, rational reason behind it is that, you know, in a, in a place of worship, our mind, our focus should be on God. So just imagine the guys over here, you're standing and next to you is, you know, literally touching a pretty girl, right? Next to you. Sometimes your mind may not be to God, maybe to, to somewhere else, correct? This is just human biology, human psychology, correct? However, one more reason can be, you know, when we pray, we have to stand, we have to bow down, we have to prostrate. So it will not be decent, guys in the back watching. That reason also. But separation in prayer, the segregation, is not limited only to the mosque, to the masjid. When you go to a Greek Orthodox church, they also have separation. When you go to an Orthodox synagogue, there is a separation. Again, for the same reason, for the sake of modesty, for the sake of decency, for the sake of focus. And we Muslims, we say we are following the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So again, thanks for coming. Thanks for bringing Emily. All right. And uh, thanks a lot. I thought that was a very inclusive conversation, um, and I think there were more participants mm -hmm. in the conversation than any of the houses of worship we've been to so far. Really? Yeah. Yes. Wow. I think you guys were very approachable and um, welcoming to all the questions, didn't make anyone feel um, poorly if they asked a question that was a little bit... Um, yeah, we want them to her. open up, right? Yeah. yeah. So Ask the questions now. I really enjoyed it, and I think they learned a lot. I had a couple who asked me a few questions just walking out, so I think you really got their brain stirring. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. It was great. Thank so, you so much for having Anything us. really quickly about this part of the tour? I actually am so glad that I saw people with their shoes off because for a second it slipped my mind, so I think it was really interesting to have an immersive part where we actually participated mm -hmm. yeah. in something related um, to the Islamic Maybe down the line, what you can do is, if uh, the school allows it, you can come during the time of the prayer, oh. and you can actually, like from there, you can oh, watch the Muslims so pray. Right. That would be very. Yeah, yeah. How many people are usually in there at once? As I mentioned, about two hundred to three hundred. So Eight the first, like maybe three, four, five rows, they get filled up. On Friday, the whole thing gets filled up. Wow! And today, two hundred. Ish. Yeah, yeah, wow. maybe more, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And also the children who are getting the full-time education, they take the break and they all come here. Wow. This is the second largest Islamic school in the whole U.S. That is really cool. Um, I definitely think that interfaith work is really important. Um, I also think that the students, um, when they have friends that are... Uh, Muslim that they might not know a lot about Islam. They've been watching their their friends during Ramadan this last month um, go through everyday things that teenagers go through, having to fast and understanding why they're fasting and watching their friends do that is really special because they see how faithful their friends are and they might not know that. Um, if they don't ask questions. Of I think course. questions are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And you do such a good job explaining Islam to students. And I think it's really, really good for them to come and meet you and see you. So you. it's wonderful when we come here. I think it's way better to see it and experience it than read about it in a book. Um, we actually watched on Amazon Prime, I don't know if you've seen it, um, One Day in the Haram. It it's like follows a pilgrimage oh. to Mecca. and. It, I think it came out two years ago, yeah. and it talks about the people who work in the water stations, bringing water to the pilgrims. It talks about the social media efforts, um, how they want to get the message of Islam out, and they have all these young, you know, twenty-year-old people working. And I feel like young people can do such wonderful things for religion. Yeah. So it's keeping religion alive and teaching young people how to work with one another, like you said, learn about one another, get to meet one another, mm -hmm. and work for humanity's sake. I think that's another reason it's great to come here and meet you and see yeah. you, and not just read about Islam in a book. Oh, sure. Welcome, and uh, may God guide and bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you so I was safely much. back.